And action. <laughs> we're, cut, we're definitely cutting that part. We all watched the movie Eternals. I feel like Keith is going to be like, hey, wait, do you even have an Eternals t-shirt on or is that? Um, uh, WandaVision, it's kind of like, you know, you don't want to wear the shirt of the band that you're at, but like the close <laughs> band. So, right, there we go. Right. <laughs> yeah. I've got the Wikipedia up here because there's oh, so many Aaron names. <laughs> So I'm Galia Volkoy, I'm a filmmaker, I'm currently working on a documentary titled Ageless, um, and Ageless is meant to show the uh, immense potential of the longevity field to have an impact on our lives when biological aging becomes treatable. Um, yeah. My name is Alessandro, and I'm an actor and producer. And uh, alongside Marlena Velario, a colleague of mine, we're working on a feature film called Genetical that is also like talking about the expansion of the, the lifespan for the longevity. I'm Keith Camito. I'm the president of uh, the nonprofit Lifespan.io, which works to raise funds and awareness for research aimed at extending healthy human lifespan, which is relevant to the, uh, the topic of this movie. Uh, additionally, although I can't talk about it too much, I also do technology development for companies like uh, Disney. And one of the things that I like to do personally is to really just engage the public in thoughtful dialogue around, you know, cool science topics that, you know, pop culture is drawing out uh, like this movie. So... One thing that you might be familiar with is I've helped to write the script for some large YouTube channels, like uh, Kors Kazak, for example, did a series on aging that I helped to write the script for. And at Lifespan.io, we actually run the YouTube channel Life Noggin, which does a lot of fun um, videos about Marvel movies and science, etc. So uh, hopefully, you know, this conversation here is another iteration of, of kind of fun pop culture stuff to hopefully get you interested in science and maybe helping us all live longer and healthier lives. Um, my name is Tim Maupin. I'm a filmmaker. I'm working on a film called The Last Generation to Die, which is a longevity fiction film that looks at the positive angle of age reversal and tells a story in that space and, you know, tries to have a, a greater conversation about longevity and how it relates, but ultimately tries to present more of a, um, a positive image rather than dystopian, uh, which I think is much needed in the longevity space. One of the things that just jumps out at me right away is, you know, one of the characters uh, named is Gilgamesh, right? Which is one of the first uh, literary heroes uh, that we have, you know, in history. Uh, maybe one of the, the first great works ever written. And in that story, Gilgamesh is, is all about questing for how to, how to overcome the diseases of aging and death because his best friend kind of dies in the story. Now, that element isn't really in the movie so much, but I think the ideas of that sense of our place in the universe and 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 what is required for a sustainable universe in a sense and how that relates to lifespan is is sort of present in the movie in a lot of ways uh there is this theme of the indiv it like the greater good versus the individual's destiny and it seems like um there is like always a conflict. That's a bit like the conversation we have um, about longevity, that sometimes there is this resistance that if you want longevity, you're selfish, you're self-centered, you only care about the individual and their long life, but you don't care about humanity. It's like humanity pays the price for this greediness. Uh, so I think in the film, too, you see like there is this greater, um, bigger picture of the uh, emergence. But uh, but for that, you have to sacrifice the individuals and they become disposable because the planet needs to be destroyed for that. Um, so I liked I liked that theme. I thought it reflected well kind of the kind of conversations we have about longevity today. So in a sense, you're almost saying that what's happening with the planet and the emergence is almost like a planetary scale version of the conversation of like, is it okay for you to live longer as a person versus whether you need to sort of die for the greater good of evolution or humanity? So uh, I can agree with that take. And I would say that I actually think based on what the characters do, there is sort of a, a counter proposal there. Uh, anybody else pick up on that based on basically what the Eternals are trying to do? That was the biggest sort of like longevity note that I took was they're trying to change the quote unquote natural order of that's been set up by I'm going to totally like f up these names or whatever. But our, our, I've got the Wikipedia open here because there's oh, so many Aaron names. Show. 
Yeah, Erisham, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah, yeah the so, I'm so bad with this sort of thing that I'm going to be like, uh, but anyway, like, you know, that's like the order that's been set up. I had to actually read all of the back history of the Eternals and everything to like fully get it. But like, um, but yeah, it seems like, you know, clearly there's been this whole setup where it's, uh, this is a way to kind of move things forward and the energy going into the Celestials and all that. And so these, the Eternals are now trying to change that order. And so to me, that was sort of like a, you could make an analogy there that that's what we're trying to do with like longevity. We're trying to change this order for, you know, again, and people talk about a lot about what's natural. I think they mentioned that a couple of times in the movie, like this is a natural order. And so they're trying to change it to save the, save humanity on, you know, planet earth or whatever. So that was the, that was the key thing that I sort of picked up in terms of, uh, analogous uh, longevity stuff. I think. I think that. I mean, what I grasped also was the responsibility that, for example, like in terms of longevity, the responsibility that the human race actually needs to have if the lifespan actually like is being extended, the amount of, uh, the amount of knowledge that that we're supposed to grasp and how we're going to use that knowledge to advance our you know lifespan, but at the same time without you know, without compromising the environment that we are living in. And that's something that also I think I grasped from, from the film itself, because at the moment at the very beginning, they're trying to help the human race, but without interfering too much. But at the same time, it comes with the responsibility that at the moment is still under progress. That's what I, that's what I grasped. Yeah, on that subject, one of the kind of undercurrents of the movie that I liked was here are these characters that are living, you know, what was it five, 7,000 years and, you know, <laughs> with some potential uh, exceptions, perhaps with what, what Icarus was doing, um, they were very much acting as, you know, even though they weren't getting involved in sort of warfare, they still kind of were interfering in a positive way. You know, Cersei was like helping with the crops and stuff. So acting as sort of stewards of the world, I guess you could say. Right. And yeah. that's an idea that I like to to sort of bring up in, you know, sometimes when people have conversations about what the proper lifespan of humanity should be. There could be this kind of conflict between, you know, the more transhumanist like forces and the more, you know, I guess you'd say traditional religious uh, forces where, you know, I don't think there needs to be that conflict. And I think the area that unites both of the mindsets is this idea of the stewardship of the earth. Right. Like if you think about in the olden days, you know, uh, people would work on building a church that would take 300 years to build because they had a sense that they were contributing to something greater than themselves, something eternal, right? And they felt good about it and they gave their life purpose. And I think now, uh, I don't think I'm breaking any news by saying I think a lot of people are experiencing a kind of existential, you know, not even dread, but more just like ennui, like a, like a lack of purpose and trying to find something, um, you know, some meaning in your life. And I think if you suddenly thought that you'd be around for a couple of hundred years, I think it would restore some of that very same, you know, sense of, of feeling of, well, I want to make sure things are good on the earth because like, I'm going to be here for a while and my family's going to be here for a while and I can't just, you know, destroy everything. So maybe I'm being optimistic, but I think that there's a potential um, uniting there. And the most of the Eternals, I think, kind of softly sort of embody that idea. I agree. I mean, one of the things that I thought was kind of interesting about, it certainly um, gets into the idea of like, is it better to have a finite ending? Like it's, it seemed like there were certain, um, like Sprite, I think, for example, clearly becomes uh, sort of human or mortal or whatever toward the end of it. And that seemed to be a topic that they really dove into is like, you know, she almost was jealous of like the, the human characters. You can sort of replace that by the fact that we have chapters in our lives. Like you, it's not like even now when we live to be 80 ish or whatever, you know, give or take, uh, we, you know, most people have chapters, whether that's something from a, a career or job standpoint or a relationship or whatever. And you certainly would just adapt that into if you lived to say two or 300 years or more, like you, that would just be kind of the, that would just be the norm. And that would be the way to sort of, in my mind, that would be the way to refresh and have a quote unquote more of a mortal, you know, there is an ending to this chapter and it's maybe not something that you can ever have again for various reasons. You know, it might, there's, there's all kinds of reasons why things will still end even inside of a container of, of a longer lifespan. So. I was just going to say one of the characters that sort of made me th think along those lines is actually one of the more I, mostly comic relief characters, Kingo, right? Where they actually kind of have this specific conversation, if you remember. It's right after they, they believe they've destroyed all of the deviants, right? And they're kind of just sitting around sort of like, 
you know, our main purpose is done. Like, what, what do we do now? Um, and there's a little bit of, um, you know, it's almost analogous to, to someone who might live a longer lifespan and might decide after 30 years they're done with their first career. And, you know, uh, should I retrain to do something else? And although, you know, he kind of sits out the final battle, so I guess you can ding uh, Kingo for that. Uh, he was one of the the Eternals that kind of, I guess you could say, successfully kind of figured that out. Where he's like, hey, you know what? I want to become a Bollywood star. And he, he seemed like he was having a good time <laughs> before they collected him. So, But the fact that their memories get erased, which we kind of discover in the middle of it, it made me feel like um, the creators maybe tried to... It's like they're Eternals, but they're not really, because when their memory is erased, it's like a new life begins. And it also, in a way, prevents their evolution, their full like evolution. Um, and also the point where uh, they realize that they actually can uh, be hurt or die, that, that they're more vulnerable than they thought they were. Um, it kind of reminded me of that moment in life where it's like so many of the people who are in, in the field of longevity say that like at age five, they discover that they're not going to live forever. And it was like a traumatic realization. Um, so I, I thought that was like a nice metaphor there. Well, it's like it feels like that it, it kind of gets to me that conversation of everything's relative. Like even though they live for much, much longer, they, they as you said, they find out that actually their memories get wiped at some point and then they restart. So there is still kind of an ending or whatever that they discover. And so again, it seems like that's just a theme that's dealt with in multiple ways in the film and, and sort of different levels of temporal scales. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a fair point to say like, why did Arishem and the, uh, you know, the celestials like, you know, build the Eternals this way. And I, I think it's a, probably a fair answer to say that by interrupting their growth and resetting it, it could, prevent sort of challenges to the celestial's power. And I think, I guess, you know, maybe I'm reading too much into it, but like a, like a little bit of a nice message there is I guess there's sort of an implicit assumption that the longer someone lives, in a sense, the more moral they'll become, because that's kind of what happened, right? You know, once the Eternals realized that this was a, a, a cyclical thing and that the greater good required these kind of sacrifices, they were like, no, like, you know, like they were they were wise because they spent so much time with these people and they're like, it's not worth the price. So there's a little bit of a, you know, like a, like a subtle positive message there that, you know, if you're a thinking person and you live a long time, you will become more compassionate, you'll become wiser. And in a sense, maybe that's what the, Celestials were trying to block by by resetting them, right? So they wouldn't interfere with their mm. plans. The uh, like the, the longevity of their eternals is what allows them to eventually kind of grow out of their initial state. A counterpoint to that sort of notion I, the, we, that we've probably all seen a lot in the longevity space is that people won't refresh. I think, um, you know, uh, who's the oh Elon Musk is the most famous person that's most recently said it or whatever. You know, like people need to die because they need to refresh ideas and people who are old, like hold on to their ideas. And this, I think, is a pretty solid counterpoint to that. And it, I think it is a fair challenge. I mean, there's another notion that most people as they age get, um, I think there's even science or research behind this or whatever now, and correct me or fill in the blanks, but like, I feel like there's been research that shows that people do get kinder a little bit as they age, they become more. Now that could also be because they know the end is pending like it's hard to say what maybe those motivations are but but anyway it does seem like that's not the end all answer is that everyone holds on to their ideas you know you know i do think it's interesting to consider that idea of again like big progress for humanity right and, and the ideas of of whether living longer or not will help that because i forget the who the exact quote was but what elon musk in your case there was probably echoing was that famous uh, quote that like you know science advances one funeral at a time Right, that it's only after the old guard dies can the new ideas uh, take root. And I, I would like to note, though, that the the fact that's kind of glossed over in that comment is how everything, especially in biology, is bound together. So let's say that's true. Let's make the assumption that for whatever reason that's that's the case. It's probably worth noting, though, that one of the things that you lose as you get older is neuroplasticity because your brain is not functioning as well. So that if we were rejuvenated and, and young, maybe that calcification due to age or whatever that sentiment is trying to get at 
will itself be uprooted by the fact that everyone is functioning like a young person, <laughs> right? And still is able to, you know, have fun and be flexible or, you know, <laughs> not to say that old people can't do that, but, you know, whatever that critique is, I think it's worth noting that it might be biologically addressed by keeping people young and healthy. No, I mean, I, that's, I feel like that's sort of what I was saying earlier is like the psychological aspects of what might happen when you rejuvenate are, are I mean, obviously we don't know, we can't know until some of these things actually begin to happen, but but I feel like there's, so there's sort of like the missing link that you can't take fully into account how people might actually turn out of that sort of that psychological narrative that, you know, people are going to hold on to their beliefs. I agree with you, Keith. I think that, like, if you feel better and you're rejuvenating, probably a lot of youthful mental states are going to re return and you're going to feel like, oh, I'm going to go do this. And that will kind of spawn new energy about different things and so forth. So. And I think it's also a bit of a myth that people young, like that older people don't make, like don't make discoveries, have make uh, push for progress. And I, I think I don't have the data, but I think, I think, I think it shows that actually the more uh, significant discoveries happen relatively late in life and i think our brains are also there is this positive thing of like they make better connections as we grow older maybe they absorb less but they like um so just more perspective um yeah when you're saying that I th i'm thinking i'm seeing in my head like a chart from like the oatmeal or like wait but why or something like that that had like the median age of like you know, landmark discoveries. And to your point, I think it was much later in life than you would, you would think. I, I mean, I always get inspired when I see stories of like people who are in their seventies and they did this amazing thing or whatever. And I, I do think even outside of the longevity conversation that, that, that sort of like societal conversation should shift a little bit more where it's like, yeah, older, older people are really doing great things. And again, and then even inside the conversation of longevity, it still speaks loudly. It's like you have that collective wisdom of 70 years. And again, that's why to me, the idea of longevity is even more powerful. It's like, it's not to say that people in their seventies or eighties or whatever, or beyond are doing amazing things, but you take that plus the aspect of, you know, like healthy body and mind. And you're like, to me, you're amplifying, you know, you're getting to that point where you're really allowing some profound things to happen. I mean, I mean, it's kind of unprecedented. We don't have, we don't really know what that would be like for somebody to have a hundred years of, of experience and memories, but also to be young and be able to go do things. Um, again, it's not to say that perhaps there could be a case where <laughs> it doesn't, you know, somebody goes off and does something terrible or whatever, but, it, but I think I tend to be more optimistic about that and think that, you know, that it could still um, be a really a net positive for humanity. So I don't subscribe to the, the great man theory of history. I think people, you know, like Einstein or whatever are a product of their environment, you know, so, so caveat what I'm about to say in that, but I do, do say, I do think that w incorporating that progress does kind of happen in like fits and starts and there are people that arise that can really push things forward like a Tesla for example right you know if you read about Tesla's life you know he didn't really have such a great go of it you know he came up with tons of amazing inventions but then had a really rough end of his life um, you know mental problems etc and you know obviously there's a lot of like what's real and what's not but you know it, it's very sort of well documented that he was far along on coming up with like wireless electricity for the world with the Schumann resonance and all this kind of stuff. So the point is, is like, if you just take that one person, like let's assume that he was onto those things for real and he had 10 more years of high productive life. That would like, that one person alone would have radically changed what like all of society would look like now. That's just one person. <laughs> so apply that to everybody. It seems very obvious to me that if we're talking about like how fast can we get onto other planets, how fast can we, you know, protect humanity writ large, uh, that extending healthy human lifespan would probably be the most impactful thing that you could do so that any time there's a, a vertex of technological improvement, it goes that much further, right? Some people could counter and say, well, then you've got, you know, the, the terrible dictators that would continue to do their terrible things or mm. only in a greater capacity. So, but I, I, again, I think broadly speaking, I, I'm more on the side of like the optimism. And I think that would, I honestly believe it would outweigh any of those negative. I think things, it's you know. Aubrey de Grey who says that like no dictator has died from old age. Usually they kind of die in other ways. Yeah. So, uh, it's, it's a yeah, risky yeah, yeah. profession. So a fair, um. <laughs> it's a fair counter to the counter. <laughs> 
what I was saying also does butt up against the sort of the classic, like, um, you know, postmodern critique of, of progress and science, you know, like, is life even better if we, you know, get better televisions or cars or whatever, which I think is, is a worthy debate to have. But the thing that supersedes it for me is that like, when you have those kind of conversations, you're really looking at humanity and sort of like this microcosm pot of itself. But like, the, the you know, and that's an open question. But the thing that's not an open question is if we have better technology, we'll be able to like shoot down that incoming asteroid that might destroy us in a thousand years. <laughs> so that's why I'm leaning towards technological progress is objectively good regardless of that conversation. And all of those like we're going to destroy ourselves with a nuclear bomb kind of thing, those risks will be present either way. We're, we're just changing the timetables on it. And in one conception, we're better prepared to fight off asteroids <laughs> as an example. So. Anyway. I thought that was also a very prominent theme in the film of like the idea of building a better world. I think they say it like a few times and this like question like and, and I think every character in the in the film has has good intentions, but they have different uh, views on, on, on how 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 that better world will seem and who who it should serve. Um, so, yeah, that's that's an interesting interesting question. One other aspect of the film that I thought, which I know has been usually touched on in a lot of longevity related films, even vampire films and things like that, um, like Only Lovers Left Alive, but it is always cool to see like the notion of kind of what it would feel like to live a very long time. Like you're seeing different periods in history and, you know, in this case, in, in Eternals, they're obviously cutting back and forth in time in different locations. I mean, I can't deny that it's always like fun, you know, it's always like fun to see how that might play out. And one, one thought that it did make me think of is, this is kind of weird, and, but it made me think of to date somebody or to be in a relationship or be married or whatever would almost be like owning a pet, you know, because pets' lives are more, uh, like, they're shorter than what we have now. So, like, you would, but I, I think a lot of people would actually agree with that sentiment because they get very attached to their pet. Obviously, we're not talking about, like, same intellectual levels or anything like that, but the, the notion of the emotional attachment and the love you might feel is... It, like the, the time spans are different. So I just had that sort of like funny thought that, you know, like that you could relate it to that. So I'm pretty sure that we, if we have the technology, like as soon as we have the technology to make our life longer, you know, we will, like, we will use the same technology to make our, you know, our animals or our love animals like longer as well. So the, the lifespan also like will be extended. I think there is a clinical trial yeah. happening right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of, uh, especially with dogs, right? A lot of dog, dog aging work yeah. right now in that Cambridge yeah. Women's uh, Lab, etc. cetera. Uh, but I was going to say that that thread right there, Tim, that's when that sort of flowers out and connects to like a lot of different media right there. Obviously, going back to ancient times, that's a version of the Tythonus myth, right? Where the goddess Aeos is in love with a human mortal, right? So a human man. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like, Cersei and Dane are kind of in that situation. Also in the Lord of the Rings, you know, uh, Arwen and, and uh, Aragorn to some extent, you know, like th this is a kind of common theme, right? And, you know, the answer is usually like the immortal should give up their immortality to be with the mortal. And that's like generally seen as the right answer. But it's worth noting that the Eternals has not answered that question yet. And the answer might go the other way maybe Dane becomes immortal, <laughs> right? Uh, which would be a really interesting inversion of that. Uh, that, would be, that would be cool to see. And on, on that, actually, that idea, I thought, obviously, it, it went south <laughs> near the end of the movie, but I thought the, the scenes with Icarus and Cersei being in love throughout time and getting like married and remarried, you know, like you kind of saw them in all the different cultures, kind of like a, like a re reiteration of their wedding scene together. Um, I thought that was a nice sentiment that, you know, wasn't really super discussed, um, you know, uh, diegetically, but I really kind of liked that idea that it wasn't like they were like, after 50 years, they were like, you know, <laughs> put the damn toilet seat up <laughs> or, or down or whatever, you know, like they seemed to be genuinely in love for a long time. And it was only this kind of, um, you know, other ideological thing that Icarus was up to that sort of brought that schism. I'm sure there were toilet seat moments that they just, th this was like a happy flashback, obviously. So there, I also thought, even though any kind of flashback always carries a notion of like, is it cheesy or not? But like, I think um, like the idea of flashing back over hundreds or thousands of years is, again, it's kind of fun. It's like, I don't know if I've seen that kind of like, it's a classic like flashback or whatever, but seeing that kind of time distance is kind of interesting. So 
Well, to put the, the the question out to to you know everybody here and and you know the audience, because um, I, I you know, I'm weird, but I think about this and it, and it actually affects my like day to day life of, like I whatever a little bit of too much personal information. I'm I'm not someone who 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 dates a lot. I, I'm very rarely kind of interested in pursuing anything, but it's not because I'm not passionate. It's partially because even though it's too much to kind of front load these things, but I, you know, I'm always thinking like, you know, I don't want to be just in a relationship that's going to be like super ephemeral. Like I want to at least believe <laughs> that when I'm in a relationship, that this is someone who I want to spend like eternity with, like with the big E, <laughs> you know, like in this movie. Uh, so that's my point is that that's something, you know, if people live, if, if it's just suddenly we're in a world where people live 200 years right now, do you think that would radically change how people date or not? I have no idea. Um, many of our choices are as a result of this, like, um, feeling that, like, you only live once and life is short. So we might be surprised maybe having a longer lifespan uh, would, would make people actually uh, uh, settle down more and hurry less. To, it, it can to really go, like, any way because also you, if fertility is expanded too. You wouldn't feel the need necessarily to have to rush and, and have a family. So maybe people are much more comfortable being single for a long period of time. It could literally go in any direction. <laughs> no, but I think I, I think that if uh, when our life uh, you know gets longer, I think in terms of a relationship, you know, we need to be able, we should be able to reinvent ourselves in terms of because at the moment, like in a in a in a, in a long term relationship. You know, we have enough time to experience new things, and I think that's what actually like keeps the relationship interesting. Like, you know, experience new things with your partner, and you know, it keeps everything exciting. And I think when the lifespan gets longer, sometimes you tend to actually settle, and uh, you know, you can't find new things to experience with your love partner. And I think when the lifespan goes longer, I think it, it's important to be able to re-experience and reinvent you know, yourself and reinvent yourself as a partner. And I think that that can work. And I think we can also like have a responsibility to do that. Yeah. You just made me think of, of kind of another, you know, like uh, benefit I would like to think of, of longer lifespans is kind of similar to what Tim was saying earlier. Like, I know I do this too. Like when you think back on your life, right, you, you can, you can clearly put it in chapters that are based on your, your, you, this is when you work this job, or this is when you were dating this person. Right. And it's kind of like, you kind of see yourself like that. But I would imagine that if you, if you live, if you live much longer, in a sense, you'd have a, a growing sense of your personal self, like the thing that is you that is behind those chapters that transcends all of the chapters. Right. So I, I would like to think that maybe you have a, a growing sense of what your actual identity is. That's not just the I work at this job and then, you know, that's that, that's how I introduce myself. I'm a, an engineer, you know, <laughs> like, no, I'm, I'm you know, if you live 300 years, you are everything. <laughs> you know, you're not just an engineer. Right. I also wonder if we break the spell of reproduction and the deadline, uh, maybe it changes everything in terms of our priorities because we're so conditioned. I mean, love is too something we we, we call it like we think it's kind of a, an, a magical thing, but it's actually kind of very, um, we're conditioned to find love and to like, basically, and, and it also comes from this place of seeking security. Um, so if, if the timeline changed and the environment changed, maybe we wouldn't even seek uh, love, at, at least not as a necessity, but more as a nice to have kind of extra privilege thing. Hmm. I, I agree that like removing the pressure of the reproductive period, I I feel like most people would probably. I mean, it it's already kind of trending that way in developed nations. I mean, in fact, there's a concern. I haven't done all the research on this, and again, I know I don't want to keep bringing his name up, but I know Elon Musk is somebody who keeps talking about like the, you know the biggest concern now is actually population decline versus population increase or whatever, and so people are already sort of having less children or having them later. Um, so, but I, but I also think it seems that if you, uh, don't have that pressure and don't have to have kids right away, you can spend a lot more time trying to figure out who you are and becoming okay. like literally just becoming more of a, of, of really becoming more of you. I think like you're actually becoming, you're, you're having more time to understand who you are. As Keith, you mentioned this long standing kind of, um, 
you know, that's a really interesting idea. All these chapters make you up. And even though you might get sort of caught up in one of them and think this is kind of who you are now, but like this grander, and again, we can, it's all relative. We can sort of do that now, but, but having that ability over 300 years, you might actually amass more of a cumulative effect of who you are, which is kind of an interesting thought. So I'll say that I generally like the movie. Um, and, you know, it wasn't as like consistently action packed or whatever as you'd normally think of, but I kind of like the, I generally like these sort of pensive movies and, you know, meditations on, on, on these kind of topics, right? And something that this movie had way more of than almost any other uh, of the Marvel properties, maybe Loki kind of uh, dips into this as well, is sort of like the real zooming out to like the cosmological perspective, right? You know, obviously with Arishem and, and things like that and what those rationales are for where the way the universe must be and how humanity kind of struggles against that, which again, uh, to the earlier conversation, I think is a macrocosmic example of the question of personal life extension. I, I felt a big question throughout the film was our free will, will and, and like, and that's, and, and that's what, um, I mean, th that's what those scenes did for me. Like when we were pulled out into like the bigger story and figuring out that they actually, all of their actions have been kind of programmed into them. And then the question, if we as humans, uh, can, can make choices really or not. That, yeah, that definitely seemed like, I mean, I agree that I was led, I mean, obviously they mentioned free will multiple times, but it certainly led to that notion as well, which, you know, again, somewhat ties in, I think, to the, the grander themes of living a long life. Um, Whether or not actually humans did have free will, because apparently like, they seemed to have been free will, but it feels to me like, like throughout the movie, it was all being orchestrated so that the population grown and grown and grown for the benefit of the of the celestial. But it feels like they didn't interfere because they wanted them to, to improve and to to learn from their mistakes and so that they can actually like create more medicines and then their life the, the lifespan gets longer. But it was it felt to me that it was more orchestrated. So not entirely sure that they actually had free will as such. Well, I think, the, the, again, that question sort of bubbles up all the way to the Celestials, mm. to even maybe Arishem, right, of like, you know, unanswerable question is unanswerable, right? You know, like what yes. – but yeah, I forgot who said it. It's like regardless of whether there's free will or not, you know, you should try to act as if you did have it <laughs> and then your life will be more interesting. <laughs> so. Um, I, I really enjoyed seeing like supernatural beings, like the key event of the film is them like kind of losing everything that made their lives make sense. Like all their belief system falls apart and we're with them and kind of in the mess of figuring it out. Uh, so that was fun seeing them kind of lost. And, and again, I think the biggest thing I took from the film was really that that debate between like what's what the individual versus the the hu humankind whatever that is like this ab abstract thing like this and, and 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 like people's reactions to technology which is always something like oh there will be overpopulation or lack of resources or inequality uh, so like the 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 greater good justifies uh individuals having uh suffering um, so I, I, that question really stayed with me most from the film. From my perspective, one of the things that I'm, I'm loving about Marvel now personally is just, uh, I'm a big fan of, you know, as mentioned before, of just all kinds of mythology. So I just love that, you know, people are having conversations about who is Gilgamesh, <laughs> you know, like th that's just like super cool. So any kind of stories that kind of delve into this sort of rich, cultural history uh i think it's just good for the world and is good for also you know people not wanting to you know have wars against each other and stuff because they'll be like legitimately interested in other people's cultures <laughs> so i just think it's an objectively good thing and uh you know one thing that i think you know maybe to bring it back to life extension that i just realized when galia was talking is in these movies you know thanos is another example here uh it's always kind of one of two choices, you know, the, like the classic thing, like order versus chaos. You know, do we uh, do we let humanity get out of control and consume all the resources or do we kill every, you know, half the people, which, by the way, is a dumb solution. It would only take a few years for the population to double again. But anyway, you know, it's these extreme black or white kind of solutions. And and that's, you know, the answer is probably something in between. And, and the real, in my opinion, the real 
heroic action is to figure out the third better way instead of accepting one of the two ways that are presented before you. And where this ties directly into life extension is one of the common sort of things that underlies all the work that we do, you know, in, in life extension is this concept of terror management theory, which came from originally this book in the seventies called the denial of death. And then it was expounded upon. And, you know, it's now like a, a common, you know, psychology coursework kind of thing, which is basically that, you know, because we can't really look at our fear of death directly heads on, this is why we kind of sublimate our, uh, our idea for life extension in having a legacy and doing good works or, or even like killing another country and proving that you're the strongest. You know, you're trying to leave a legacy. You're trying to say, hey, I mattered. I exist. Right. But the, the point that, that I'm bringing this up, the reason why I'm tying it together is in that earlier work and which still carries forward now, you have two options. You either accept that nothing is permanent and you become like Buddha or Yoda and you're like, whatever, like everything's going to die. I'm just going to enjoy the moment. Or you try to fight that and become evil. There's no positive confrontation. There's no third way. So that's why I'm saying it's related in a sense to the subtext of this movie. It's like the answer isn't like what Arishim is saying or the opposite. It's somewhere in the middle. <laughs> you know, um, you know I, to be honest, I so I didn't read a bunch of reviews. I did see that on like Rotten Tomatoes or whatever, it had like a 47 percent, which you know, it's kind of hard not to see that when you're looking it up or whatever. So I had some sense that it wasn't critically received as maybe as well as like, um, but I also like, I, I personally, I saw um, one of her prior films, Chloe Zhao, um, the writer, which I, I love that movie. Like I, I was, I was moved, actually moved to tears in the theater when I saw that. I just, it was to me, she was not actors. It was much, much, much lower budget, totally different world. But I, I couldn't say enough good about that movie when I saw it. So I was very curious to see what somebody like that would do with like whatever crazy budget this was, like 200 million or whatever it is like, and just see how that would translate from a very tiny indie movie to something incredibly massive. Um, and I think it was interesting. It, I, I also don't have the, I have, to be honest, I haven't seen a bunch of the comic book movies or the Marvel movies, so I don't have all the reference there, but I personally, I don't know why this is. I get very bored by action scenes. I, I Every time there's an action scene, I'll notice like five minutes later that I have no idea what just happened. And to me, it's always like, it, there's always like, if you think about action scenes, they're like punch, they're like, there's all these little things are going on, but there's always an outcome of like, whatever the, the full action scene is going to. And I'm always just like, oh, cool. They, they won or they didn't. Like, I don't need to, I just, I simply don't care or engage with all the little components of the action. Um, but I mean, as far as I could tell, I thought all that stuff was well done. The overall film, to me, I kind of like uh, agree with what you mentioned about the Rotten, uh, Rotten Tomatoes uh, type of uh, reviews. I feel I enjoyed watching the film, but I would have loved to have like more depth into the characters and maybe like have a, a bit more story behind them so that I can actually care about those characters. I would have... I would have uh, develop those characters more. That's my, 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 I mean, I enjoyed watching the film, but again, I got lost into most of the dialogue, you know, because I couldn't care too much for them. Yeah. I'll say that I, I, I did enjoy the movie uh, quite a bit, you know, definitely on the upper end of the spectrum for me. Uh, what held it back from like, you know, top tier is the same kind of sentiment, which is that, uh, I feel like a lot of interesting ideas and like, you know, philosophical questions were kind of, you know, alluded to enough to get you thinking as the, uh, as the audience member, but I would have liked to, you know, if there was enough time, like a deeper exploration of some of these issues, um, even more like, you know, the softer ones, like, you know, what was, uh, what was a 5,000 year, uh, marriage, like, <laughs> you know, things like that, uh, you know, and who knows, maybe they'll, maybe they will be a series. Maybe they'll go back and fill in these blanks. So, uh, I tend to be very optimistic, though. A movie has to try really hard for me to, like, not enjoy it, and I enjoyed this. <laughs> not to say it wasn't good. I, I liked it, yeah. I mean, I felt the same way when I started, when, when, when the film just started. And I'm, I'm not used to watching these kinds of films, and, and I was happy for this, like, opportunity, too. It was, it was fun. Uh, but, like, right in the beginning, it's like this paragraph, like, summing up all the characters and what happened. And I'm like, wait, do I need to take notes? I'm like, I was quite confused for some of it. 
I think that there might have been too many characters and not enough time to really... Mm. It's like I didn't find myself fully caring about each character because someone made the point that a lot of the action happens off screen, or a lot of the a lot of their key story parts happen off screen. Um, like the African American character, I don't remember the name, but like you, like that's a really interesting idea that he might have led to the evolution of technology that the atomic bomb or whatever uh, had had it like an existential crisis about it and then had a family. That's a, actually a really great story, but we don't see hardly any of it. It's like there's it such a short amount of time on screen, and I think there was debate about should this could this have been a better series? Maybe it could have. I don't know, but um, but I thought. That and then the only other, the only other critique I would have is, and again this could just be from somebody who's not like a comic book movie person, but like I felt like the plot was just a little bit convoluted. There were moments where I was like, wait a minute, so this you know this happened, and like especially once the Celestials and there's so many names flying around and everything, you're sort of like, all right, I think I get the overall picture, but I'm definitely going to Wikipedia to read the plot on this afterwards. But, you know, so like that's just maybe just me, but. But I, I, again, I appreciated a lot of the ambition and I think it was, I don't know if it was fully successful, but I think it was um, a, a good a good attempt and, and a lot of good things about it that worked. So that's my review. <laughs> so yeah, it's funny because it almost seems like the grandest critique of the film you could, or at least say, and even hearing kind of it echoed a little bit is like, it was like just more of it would have been like almost like solved the problem. So it's like, it's, a, it's almost like hard to critique it as a bad, film or anything like that it's just like it just and it was already you know pretty long maybe it and it strangely felt long and i think it's just because we never were able to fully grab on to each one of those characters or whatever so i i think a really interesting question as filmmakers um is uh would this work as a series like what would be lost like what would be gained like is there i mean obviously we just talked about the time scale maybe a concern for a series would be the budget would be less so you wouldn't get these bigger pieces or although these days i feel like that's changed considerably for series so i also saw nomad land and really liked that which is her other pretty big movie won an oscar for it um but ultimately i think she's a great filmmaker and so for me it was like really amazing to see it i also thought one of the pretty refreshing thing is is that she you know the cast of characters was you know it, it was both diverse but also just diverse in all kinds of ways, you know, it's just, uh, there's a lot of different characterizations and, you know, a lot of different uh, types of folks being embodied, which you don't see often in those kind of big movies. And so I thought that was really great too. Um, so yeah, I think there's, there's a lot to love and, um, and clearly it spawned a lot of good conversation with us. So I uh, hope everybody enjoyed this. And if you like these kind of conversations, um, you should have a sense of, you know, the kind of movies that we can talk about. So definitely leave like, you know, uh, comments with some movie suggestions. Obviously, we've got some uh, on our list. They don't all have to be Marvel movies, although some of them would be cool. <laughs> and, uh, you know, a lot of us here, you know, in addition to being um, part of uh, the Jellyfish DAO, which you can find out information on in the description, you know, I'm sure we're all part of a lot of different organizations and charities that are doing uh, both media-related work and uh, work related to life extension, which are both relevant to this conversation. So if you want to learn more, you can... Uh, check that out in the description or you know follow us on on all the things and there you go there you go there, there's the the, the psa